Hello, how's everybody doing? Welcome. Mrs. Hall here. This is a DBQ number five for the 2020 AP World History five document DBQ. So this is our final DBQ we're going to be going through. This is uh, DBQ number five. You should have written this one. Um, so if you have not written this one, stop. Go and write it. Set the timer for 45 minutes. Remember, this is an altered one for the altered 2020 AP exam. Um, so 10 minutes planning, 35 minutes writing. And when you're done with that, then come and watch this video. And we will be doing self-edit based on the modified rubrics, 10-point modified rubrics uh, for that. All right. So if you haven't already, uh, if you hand wrote it, go ahead and have it ready. Um, I'll go ahead and print the rubrics. It's available on the website. I linked it actually right with this document um, with the number five DBQ. So um, I would go ahead and just print that if you want to have the rubrics in front of you, or you can just keep track on your essay as we go through it. Like I said last time, we go pretty much in order other than grouping. We do that kind of upfront, just makes it a little bit faster, but on that, we do pretty much in order. Um, if you typed it, go ahead and print it. And same thing, it's just easier to kind of mark it, keep track of it as you're going. All right, so here we go. We're going to jump in. All right, the prompt said, okay, the prompt said, um, elevate the, or elevate, evaluate, sorry, evaluate the extent to which Christian missionary efforts motivated European imperial expansion in 19th century, so it's 1800s Africa, okay? So again, we're seeing, what word are we seeing again? Extent, okay? Extent is yet again a word we are seeing. Now, I've gotten this question a couple of times. Are we going to see this on the AP exam? I don't know, but they seem to like this one. This has been on more recent ones. It's a word they like to see. Now, again, extent can mean a lot of different things. It can mean, you know, um, like a barometer. It could be, it, it, it's very applicable, but it's also, um, it's not something that just means hot, cold. It doesn't mean, you know, a lot, a little, none. Um, so, with this, though, you're, you, you're, you're saying extent of what? Well, whatever lens the question is asking, which in this case is Christianity, right? So basically, it's the extent of what? The, the role, to simplify it, that Christianity has in the expansion, imperial expansion. So remember, imperialism is the domination of one country over, the, over another economically, um, politically, and culturally, right? And so we talk about that a ton. Now, the main motivation of imperialism is economics, right? And then you politically and culturally end up dominating them, dominating them in order to get economically what you want, okay? So they're kind of trying to say, it, to what extent do we see Christianity playing a role in this? You know, so are we going to see it a lot, a little? Um, will it be the only thing? Um, will it be incorporated? Will it be, you know, so to what extent? So we know that Christianity is going to be all throughout these documents. We just have to say, to what extent is it playing a role with this imperialism and as they're expanding? So that is what we're looking for. To what extent is Christianity and imperialism overlapping as Europeans are expanding through Africa. So to what extent are we seeing missionary work and European imperialism, so that government economic motivation, to what extent are they overlapping? Is missionary work separate or is it overlapping with the works of the government? Do we see only missionary work going on or do we see them kind of, you know, intertwining, maybe using it as, you know, a scapegoat or they, or maybe economics, you know, sometimes we, 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 we mix business with pleasure, so to speak, you know what I mean? Religion with politics, so to speak. Um, and so, so to what extent are we seeing that? So as we go through each document, let's maybe kind of keep that in mind. And when they say European, that could mean a lot of different people. So maybe also look at source, maybe look at themes of who is being involved. That's another thing where maybe there's one area or one group that's doing this a lot versus someone else. So there's a lot of different directions that can go with that. Um, maybe how much is it overlapping? So we could look to that, but we could also maybe see who, what Europeans. So there's a couple different lenses we could look for when we look through source and then also, you know, what's actually happening. So keep those things in mind as we're going through the documents. And like I said, as we're going through the documents, keep this in mind as kind of our focus of discussion. So when I get to the discussion points, I'll go through those pretty quickly, but kind of count you know, kind of take notes of when I go over the documents um, and I kind of highlight what I think they're about and what you need to be highlighting. Um, that's when you kind of need to be looking in your body paragraphs of, you know, did you highlight or get the right kind of ideas from them? Okay. Um, so that when I get to the discussion things, I don't have to go back over the documents in so much detail. All right, here we go. 
Document one. Okay, so the source is the King of Madagascar, so that island off the east coast of Africa. So it's a letter to the London Missionary Society of England. So it's the King of Madagascar writing to someone in England, Missionary Society. Okay, so in the past, I entered a treaty with the British to end the slave trade. Um, when this Mr. Jones came to my kingdom as part of the delegation, he sent with him... Um, he sent a missionary, Mr. Jones, okay? So basically what he's saying is like when I was working out this treaty with Britain to end the slave trade, they also sent this missionary. So he's right there off the bat saying, you know, when I was doing political business with Britain, they were mixing religion with it. They sent in. And in the second paragraph, you know, he basically loved it, okay? So they did their business, and in the second paragraph, he's saying, you know, after careful examination of the plan of his mission, I happily agreed, was satisfied, satisfied with the explanation of your society, and therefore I'm requesting more. So we see in the second paragraph, so he gives the nature of the first contact of missionaries in Madagascar. In the second paragraph, he's saying he loves it, and he wants more of them to come. He likes what they're doing. He likes the services they're providing. He likes what they're bringing on, you know, the charity work they're doing and the message that they're having, and so he wants more to come. So what we're looking for is to what extent. Extent. So what extent are we seeing this? Well, so first we see the source is England, right? So that this, this African connection is Madagascar with England. So we see what European connection is England. So that's something we could notice as possible grouping. But also to what extent we do see a political religious reference here where he's saying that, that, that the British used this treaty negotiation that they sent missionaries along with it. So I would kind of make note of both of that. I would say that there's a British element or an English element to this right? That's a European extent. But then there's also a mix of government. It's not just religion, right? We see that there's an official capacity here going on, that the government's being used and they incorporated missionary work into their treaty work to probably soften the blow, to help, you know, appease to the, you know, to the king of Madagascar. Look, we care about you. Look, we're here to educate you. We're here. Because remember, a lot of the missionaries, they built hospitals, schools, they were there to educate, and then that's how they would reach people. You don't just reach people by saying convert or die. You you build hospitals, you build schools, you, you serve people. People and then you convert people. That's how you do it. You care for them, you help the poor, and then through through those services and help, then you convert people. So bringing those services and help to impoverished areas, that's going to make a king happy. So it's going to make a political deal even sweeter. So I kind of, I, I definitely see a, an extent here, a mix here going on. Okay, document two. So this is a uh, Nigerian former slave who became a member of the English Church Missionary Society. Um, and so this is describing his expedition into West Africa, okay? So this is interesting. So he goes on and on. He talks about the reception he had where he visited. Um, third paragraph, I believe the time has come when Christianity must be introduced to the banks of Niger. The people are willing to receive missionaries. Um, God has provided instruments to begin his work. Um, fourth paragraph, it takes great effort. Um, when those liberated Christians from Sierra Leone still or sit down, with these heathen countrymen, it goes on and on. So he's basically talking, he's basically what he did is he went on an expedition to West Africa uh, to scope out a new area, maybe to set up a mission. And he's reporting back that he thinks that this place is ready. Okay, now here at the bottom, he's saying in Sierra Leone, West Africa, was a colonial territory established by Great Britain for resettled former African slaves liberated by the Royal Navy in 1807. Okay, when um, the British abolished slavery. So there really isn't a political reference here. There really isn't anything about economics. There's nothing about mines or trade. It's purely about setting up a mission, and it's really about sending former slaves there. It's not even really about sending, like, white Christian missionaries there. It's about sending a former slave who is a convert there. So there is an English reference here because it's, a, it's an English missionary. So we do see an English influence here, right? These are former slaves who are of English origin or who have been freed by the British. So we do see... A British, British reference there, so you could make note of that. But when we look at document one, we definitely saw more political overlap. Do you know what I mean? This one, I don't see it. This one, I see just purely like they're looking to go to a really remote area. And this mission is looking to send not white Europeans. They're looking to send former slaves, in this case, former African slaves who have converted into this area. Um, so it's just they kind of went on an expedition, let's go check out this area, and then now they're willing to send former slaves there. So I would say this more this is a less extent of European imperialism and more just about missionary work. So less political influence. Less of the imperialism, more of the Christian missionary work, if you see what I'm saying, compared to document one. Okay, document three. 
again, another African convert to Christianity, okay, a ministry missionary of the Scottish United Church. So not Britain, but part of the UK. Okay, so part of the UK. So we see similar to document two in that it's a convert. So it's an African convert um, to Christianity associated with the UK. So for location or European influence, we do see maybe not British, but UK. So, you know, at least the British Isles um, again. And in this one, it's really interesting. So he's talking about here at the bottom, he's talking about these diamond mines um, in South Africa. So he went to these diamond mines and he's talking, He when he first got there, he, so he's been there two years. And so when he got there, the first paragraph, when he got there, these diamond mines, people working there, he's talking about basically it was just, you know, people of both colors, black and white, he's saying it was really rough, basically. Everybody was just living a crazy life and doing whatever he wanted. And then in the second paragraph, he's saying after two years of hard work, he's saying, um, there's kind of two lives, and he's saying that he's made great progress, or they've made great progress, and that um, now after now after two years, you kind of see two walks. You know, half lives a, a more moral life. You know, they're living in the gospel and God, and they've converted, and some are still living in sin and you know this crazy life, but some have converted. And he's saying now here at the end, um, now because of that, they're being more prosperous. There's there's more um, they're there's better legislative, better government, better work ethics, so things are not so barbaric, and they're being more prosperous in their work because they're living a more um, contained, you know, religious life, you know, so not so crazy. Um, so this one's interesting because, again, you see you see the, the, the UK influence, the Scottish influence, but you see a convert like in document two, not necessarily so direct like in document one. Um, and this one, I don't really see as much political influence. Again, it's just about converting people in a more solid lifestyle, but you don't see as much uh, political influence, again, as you see in document one. Document one had just a real direct uh, message of that political influence and how they sent missionaries in to help with treaty to help with treaty negotiations, and you just don't see that as much here. So one, two, and three, you do see common roots of the UK, one and two, the British, but Scottish close by, you know, with neighbors. Um, but two and three, you see less uh, political influence. One, you see more political influence, I think, um, you know, incorporated. Okay, document four, let's look at source. Uh, the White Fathers of um, Cardinals, so this is a Catholic reference, a uh, French textbook illustrating aspects of French colonial empire. So basically, this is a picture of white fathers in French um, French missionary society in 1868 looking to spread Christianity to the French African colonies. Okay, now, looking at this picture, um, I think it's really interesting. So first and foremost, French. So for now we actually are getting a different uh, European reference. So one and two were British, three was Scottish. So uh, you had that kind of UK reference. Here we have a completely different European reference. So we do see kind of a different reference possibly for extent. We see a different reference there. Here's this really interesting. It's a picture. So it's kind of like, well, how, how do you read the extent of Christianity and political or economic? Well, look at the picture, okay? At the top, you see an anchor, you see a gun, you see, um, you know, you see um, a cannon, um, you see flags, you know, so more official. Um, you look at the men. They're not so much dressed like missionaries. You see a couple of them mounted on the camels. They're dressed more like missionaries, but then you see soldiers with them. Um, you see uh, a soldier here on the left. You see a sailor here on the right. You see ships in the background. You see a lighthouse. You see a watchtower. So, what the, the reference I'm getting from this is you see missionaries, but you also see officials from the French. You see a mix, in my opinion. You see not just missionaries. You see people of representing the French looking for colonial opportunities, but you also see French missionaries who are along with this ride. So I think you see a, quite a bit of incorporation with this one. So to me, this gives me more of a vibe of document one, where you see a mix of the imperialism. You see that political economic reference. They're looking for trade. Again, the weapons being involved, that conquering possibly, um, negotiating because you have the military there. You do see you, the, the, the men on camels, they're dressed more like missionaries, but the men um, here in the picture with the helmets, the man here on the left, um, they're more like soldiers. Um, and then the more of the reference of the ships, again, that gives you more of an official capacity, the French flags, more of an official capacity. So this is definitely not just mission work that they're communicating. There is definitely more of a government economic aspect involved in this. So you have a different 
location aspect in the other documents, but I feel a little bit of a connection to document one in a crossover of missionary as well as official capacity, you know, representing your country. So um, I hope you kind of see what I'm pointing out in that. Okay, document five, our last document. Okay, look at source. So this is Marine and Overseas Ministry of Portugal, so Portuguese. Instructions to the bishops, okay, of the Portuguese Catholic bishops going to uh, Mozambique, okay? So basically, this is instructions to missionaries going to serve in um, Mozambique, and these are characteristics that they are obliged to follow. Now, when you look at these five, they pledge to, you know, serve the bishop. They pledge to use and teach Portuguese. Uh, they pledge to, you know, use the flag, they, um, the, both at the mission building, the courts, to ensure that they defend the rights of the Portuguese sovereign, both um, Christian propaganda, exercising the missionary function, render the Portuguese authorities. So it's really interesting because this is about missionary work, but what do you see incorporated through all of their pledges? Not just loyalty to religion, but loyalty to the Portuguese, the flag, the language, the courts, um, their sovereignty, the Portuguese sovereignty, the colonial authority, the Portuguese colonial authorities, um, the language. And so again, I see a real incorporation of um, Christianity, um, Catholicism in this case, and um, the official capacity, European imperialism, so the government aspect of it, okay, kind of like I was talking about in document one and in document four. Um, again, if you want to do take like the European aspect like location, you have Portuguese, so one, two, and three, you kind of had that UK, British, Scottish, UK aspect, document four was French, this one is the Portuguese, you have different Europeans being um, represented, but if you want to take the extent of that Christian um, and then imperialism aspect, this one I think you definitely see a crossover. You definitely see a crossover with the verbiage. And this isn't just about serving God and serving the church. This is about staying true to your country and that you are doing both, you know. Um, and just because you are, you know, in Mozambique doesn't matter. You are to, you are to live the true loyalty of a Portuguese citizen, you know, through these five things that you are surrendering yourself to. Okay, contextualization. Let's talk about contextualization. All right, so these are things leading up to uh, European imperialism, Christianity in Africa in the 1800s. Okay, so 1800. Now, they said 19th century. That's 18th. So that's the entire century. Okay, so you want to do what's leading up to that. What's leading up to that? So you could go kind of far back with this. What is What's establishing the contact of European imperialism in Africa? What's establishing the contact of that relationship? So you could go all the way back to European exploration age. We all know that the Portuguese started that, right? Henry the Navigator down the west coast of Africa, who originally just made those stop-offs of ports trying to find the southern tip of Africa, eventually to find his way to India, right? The West Indies. You could talk about the slave trade, the, the true original roots of European imperialism in Africa was the slave trade, right? That was, other than having stop off places for trade, um, the slave trade was the number one economic, the nature of the economic relationship that Europeans had with Africa, and then it grew from there. A triangular trade grew out of this, right? Um, we know that as Europeans um, would get slaves from Africa, then take them to the Americas, and then things from the Americas back to Europe. Um, or the Atlantic slave trade, which is what that portion of the Atlantic slave trade would be called, right? Okay. The three Gs are going to become the big motivation for that, right? They're looking um, to serve God. That's the missionary aspect. They're looking for the glory, right? Each country, the British wants their claim, the French want their claim, the Portuguese wants their claim. So we see that in the documents. And the gold, right? We see that in the diamond mines we see that in you know each of them wants their territories so we see a little bit of all of that imperialism so what is imperialism so you could totally because it's mentioned in the prompt talking about the history of imperialism would be a great defining what it is right uh the domination of one country over the over another politically economically culturally that would be great um it is it is supported by the industrial revolution the industrial revolution is in the interior movement of Europe. And so imperialism is the exterior manifestation of that. It's, we have all this new modern technology, but we lack supplies, right? We lack raw materials. So imperialism is the manifestation of that, going out and getting those raw goods and taking from people less fortunate. So the need for raw goods. So you could talk about the need for raw goods and the industrial revolution, that the need, the 
that European imperialism, the nature of it was the Industrial Revolution, the need for raw goods. So that could be a really good one you could talk about. Um, what was it that Africa was offer, offering that, uh, that, that people in Europe wanted? So you could go into more details about that. Now, in order to get a point for this, you would need to at least at least three or four things, okay? So uh, gold is a big one, right? Uh, the diamond mines, I forgot to list that there. Um, palm oil, remember that replaced slaves, that was really huge. Ivory, timber, I'm sure there's more I'm forgetting. Um, that you could put on there, okay? Now, why did it take so long? So you could talk about the history, why it took so long. Why did this imperialism not start till the 19th century? So you could talk about why it took so long. That would be a great angle to take, right? Africa really was the last frontier of imperialism. We talked about that. And that was due to two major things, right? Lack of weapons and lack of medical technology, in particular malaria, right, um, was the thing that kept us from going in. And quinine will, will be the, the game changer. So that's gonna be a really good outside source that you could talk about later. Not so much with contextualization, but outside source later, I think, is really good, which leads to the African scramble. Again, not for contextualization, but for outside source. So you could talk about the lack of weapons and the lack of medical technology that made Africa so hard. And it wasn't until the 19th century that they had what they needed. And that's when we talked about imperialism. The 19th century, we call it the new imperialism. If you guys remember that, that final phase of imperialism. Um, was new technology both in weapons and in the medical institutions, okay? A white man's burden was a part of that Christ, Christian missionary. You know, why was Christian missionary work such a big part of European imperialism? So you could talk about white man's burden, what that was and what that looked like. African scramble, I will not accept for that because it was later, 1884, 1885. It was so toward the end of the 19th century. That's going to be a really good outside source, Berlin Conference, all that kind of stuff. Do that later. Okay, don't count that for contextualization, all right? Now, if there's something else, we're really looking for things that led up to the 19th century, okay? So like I said, most of this stuff leads up to. Uh, so the new the new weapons, African scramble, quinine, um, breech-loading rifles, things like, those are really good outside sources. Those are not, so like, contextualization uh, because those are things that happened during the 19th century that allowed for the European imperialism. Contextualization is what led up to it. So this is all what led up to it. It, and then those other things will be really good for outsources. Okay, grouping, here we go. So hopefully you already kind of saw where I was going with this. These are the two, I feel like, obvious directions that you could go with it, okay? So um, these are the two I see, and then I'll tell you which one I like the best. So let's talk through both, and I'll tell you which one I like the best, but I think either could work. All right. Here's the easy one. I feel the easy one is geography. So if you wanted to do it, uh, extent of European interest in Africa, all of them have an aspect of Christianity. So that is there. So the extent you could take, you could use the geography lens. Okay. So you could use United Kingdom. Document one and two are, Brit are Britain. Um, document three is Scottish influence. So that's why you would need to use United Kingdom, you know, to kind of incorporate those. And then you could do French, Portuguese, you know, kind of mainland of Europe you know, as it's separate. Um, so you could do that. So that's the easy one, I feel. Here's the one I like better, though. Okay, I feel this one is a little bit more on point with the imperialistic aspects, the Christian imperialism. How much do we see Christianity and imperialism clashing? Okay, and so I feel like you kind of have one group that shows those two clashing and one that shows Christianity or the church more isolated. And I feel like I kind of talked about that or hinted at that with all the documents, okay? So I would do one, Again, your, your groups don't have to be verbatim the way I'm saying as far as what I'm saying. They just have to infer. So don't get so caught up in my verbiage. As long as the, your labeling is implying the same thing, um, then you should be good, okay? If you're not implying the same thing, then that's when you need to worry about your grouping, okay? So this is the one I like a little bit better. Uh, this one's I think is a little harder, but this one I think is more true to the prompt. So the first one, European extent, I think that one's a little easier, but I think it's less insightful, less complexity. Um, the second one I think is more insightful. All right. So where, and it, because when you look at the prompt, it says extent that Christianity, Christian missionaries and European imperialism have in African um, expansion, right? This one really addresses that more focused. Okay. Whereas the other one does to an aspect, but a little less directly. Okay. So I really like this second one the best. 
So I, I kind of label that government influence with, Christ, with the church. So how much do they overlap? So document one, you really see that when the British were negotiating with Madagascar, how they incorporated the missionary work and that used that as kind of a bribery. And the king of Madagascar really liked it. In fact, he requested more. Document four, you see that when the French are scoping out their colonies. Yes, they have missionaries, but you see they have soldiers. They have their flag. Like they're clearly, you know, they're killing many birds with one stone. The three Gs are going on at once. God, glory, and gold. Okay. And then document five, same thing. Thing. Those who are, who are going to serve in Mozambique for, you know, for the Portuguese crown, even though they're serving the Catholic Church, they are, you are not just there for the church, you are there as a Portuguese Catholic, okay? You are speaking the Portuguese language, the flag, you are to be loyal to them, to their courts, you know, so there's a real clarity that, that they are working together, that the church is not alone, okay? Now, documents two and three, even though they say that, here's, here's why the, they really show isolation. One, these are Africans, Africans who have converted, so they aren't Europeans themselves, they are converted. Now they are working with uh, European missionaries, but they themselves are not European, so that's important. Second, they're not really talking about anything economic, they're purely just talking about going and converting people. There's really nothing economic, um, there's really no focus on economics. Now even though in document three they're talking about the mines, there still isn't really much mention of any involvement other than, and if it was really about um, the government aspect of it, you would probably be hearing, to be honest, because this was about white men's burden, there was a lot of racism, you would probably be hearing from a white missionary to be to be realistic, okay? So two and three, um, you really, you really, again, you don't see, you don't, you're not hearing um from a white European, you're hearing from an African who's converted, even though they're associated with the Christian church, and they're just reporting back on their mission work. It's really not beyond that. You don't see any other incorporation of Europeans. Where one, four, and five, you see direct linking to the governments, whether it be in the picture, in the pledge, or in the letter itself. Okay, so I feel like those are really directly related. So these are the two groupings that I like the best. Okay, so thesis statement. In the restatement or rephrase of the prompt, um, okay, so... So really quick, I probably should have clarified this a little bit better. So for contextualization, you should have had at least four or five of those facts, okay, or details to get that point. Uh, to get the complexity grouping point, um, you obviously needed to use all five documents, and I would like to see you have one of those two, okay? So one of those two, unless you are just really married to another one and you feel it's great, email me, but I feel like those two were, were the most obvious and really in line with um, what the prompt was asking. Okay. All right. Thesis statement. Here we go. So to get, this is for the third point. Okay. So um, for the restatement, you'd have extent, uh, Christian missionaries, or if you just said, if you said Catholic missionaries, I'll take that. If you said Europeans, imperial, if you said imperialism, imperialist, some version of imperialism. Okay. Expansion. If you said 1800s, I'll take that instead of 19th century. And then of course, Africa. All right. Um, and then your grouping needs to be similar to what we said. Again, if your labels were slightly different, but you need to have basically the same intent, okay? If you were not making basically the same intent of what my labels were, um, then don't give yourself the point, okay? And then again, remember, it's group fact, group fact, okay? So you list the name of the group, and then you summarize a document or uh, summarize the documents. No document numbers, okay? So rephrase the prompt, restate the prompt, restate the prompt, group fact, group fact, group fact. Okay, or in this case, just group fact, group fact, because we just had two groups. In this case, I really feel like you didn't need a third group. Um, the way that I did the grouping, I felt like that you really had, I guess you could do Scottish separately, but I, I feel like UK, because it's so close to, Scottish is so close to British, like you could kind of tie those together. Okay, here's our evidence points. Again, so I'm going to go through these pretty quickly because I already discussed the documents. So you should already kind of know if you were on the right track. So even if maybe you group the documents a little differently, looking at your discussion of the documents, if you were not getting the essence of what I was talking about, then you are misinterpreting the documents, okay? And again, you need to be really harsh with yourself. So there are three points for this which are broken down as below, okay? So the first point, this is just basic discussion. This has nothing to do with grouping. This is just basic discussion that two out of any, any two out of the five documents, nothing to do with grouping. You could have totally misgrouped the documents. Let's say you didn't do grouping. You just literally discussed document one, document two, you just went straight through it like vanilla. Okay. Um, you could still get this point. Okay. This is just that you did a general discussion that gave, this is like doing subject for soaps. You give a general summative, correct statement of the document, aka in your own words, gave a general description of the document. 
you summarized in a couple of lines, here's generally what the document's about, and you're accurate. Okay, so if you did that for two or more documents, you get one point. So if you hand wrote it, remember your, your goal is at least at least two lines. Okay, now if you're typing about one and a half. All right, now for these last two, this is the complexity part. This is the quality. This is where you have to connect to the prompt. So that first one, that's just for general discussion. But these next two, this is a build upon where you have to tie it back to the prompt. And, and, and here's really how you do that. The easiest way to tie it back to the prompt you, you might not like it, but here's the reality, grouping, okay? Uh, grouping forces you to tie it back to the prompt because you're analyzing an aspect of the prompt. For instance, if you did geography, then you're, you're analyzing UK or British aspect of European imperialism, Christianity, or French or Portuguese. Or if you did the second version of grouping, you could analyze government church aspect of imperialism versus no aspect of European imperialism, just the church, you know? So you are addressing a part of the prompt, which is going to show quality of discussion tying to the prompt, okay? So in order to get the second point, all right, two documents need to be connected to the prompt. So how do you do that? Two documents have quality discussion, meaning that they meet the requirements of the first uh, point, okay? So they have at minimum two lines of handwritten or 1.5 lines of typing or more, and they are correctly grouped, okay? So if you don't have two documents that are correctly grouped, now here's what I mean by correctly grouped, two documents in the same group, so you can't have one document in one group, one document in another group, and have a group, right? So two documents in one group, okay? So for instance, maybe documents th uh, four and five you put in a group. So you were like, I did that one right. Okay, great, all right? So however you grouped it, but that two of the documents are in the same group together making a correct group. So you had it two documents that were correctly discussed and two documents that made up at least one correct group. So those two documents have to be in the same group, not just two documents in two different groups, okay? Then for that, that third point, so this is the hard one. This is the one where most of you probably aren't getting it. If you are, then pat on the back to you. So four documents meet the requirement of number one, meaning that you did a general good discussion. So when I went over the document that you were putting a check mark next to it, you were like, yep, okay, yeah, I did a good discussion of it. As I was going through each document, you should have been going through each one and putting a check mark or an X next to it for your interpretation of it. Yes, I, I'm hitting on the things Miss Hall is basically saying. Nope, I'm not saying anything like she's saying, okay? If, if you're hitting on close to what I'm saying, that's great. If you're not, that's a misinterpretation of the document, folks. Do not give yourself credit for it, okay? For the third point, at least four of the documents not only need to be discussed correctly, all right, at least two or more lines of handwriting, 1.5 or more of typing, and four must be grouped correctly, okay? So they must be discussed correctly and they must be grouped correctly. So that means two and two. So that means you have two correct groups. So that means one document could be discussed wrong and could be grouped wrong. So that means you have to have two correct groups. So, so two documents in one group, two documents in another group, okay? All right, outside sources, so evidence beyond the documents, aka outside sources, um, so there's two points for this, okay, so there's a long list um, from this, and again, a lot of this you could incorporate um, also from the contextualization list, remember you just can't double dip, so if you already used it in contextualization, so I'm going to repeat myself a little bit, but if you already used it in contextualization, you can't use it again, but if you didn't use it in contextualization, you definitely could use it again, and then there's some things like um, Berlin Conference, African Scramble, and stuff like that that you could add in, um, and things like that, okay, so, um, so we'll go into that, all right, so you could talk about African Scramble all day long, if you did not talk about African Scramble or Berlin Conference, that should not say 1184, that should say um, 1884, sorry, that's a typo on my part, that should say 1884, okay, so if you said African Scramble or Berlin Conference, you don't have to have the date, if you talk about the new technology, so like Quinnen, breech loading rifles, gunships, things like that, excellent, very good, okay, now, for each of your outside sources, remember, you should be discussing at least two lines or 1.5 lines if you're typing. Um, remember, it you have to justify. It's not enough just to mention it. You can't just be, oh yeah, and they also have the African scramble. Like, no, you need to like go into that and give the example that the biggest jump of African or European imperialism was triggered by the African scramble at the Berlin Conference. You could also talk about the two exceptions. This was a great one. If any of you did this, high five to you, air high five. This is a great one. Ethiopia, Liberia, right? Only two nations who were not taken dur during European imperialism because they had bought um, 
the machine guns, right, and um, European weapons. Uh, you could go, again, you could basically go through the contextualization list. Uh, European exploration age, the Portuguese started uh, this in the 1500s, slave trade, triangular trade, the three Gs, imperialism, uh, the need for raw goods, um, palm oil, gold, ivory. Um, you could talk about the lack of weapons, white man's burden, um, you know, again, all those things would totally work. Um, what I forgot to put on this list that you also could use, you could talk about later on, um, decolonization later in the 20th century. So you could go outside the timeline if you wanted um, for this and still get points. So you could talk about like decolonization. You could talk about apartheid South Africa. You could talk about, uh, you know, those movements and the, the struggles, you know, the inequality um, that we're going to see, still see today. You would need to go into some detail for that. Um, Nelson Mandela, you need to go into some of that stuff. If you have something specific, um, that you wanted to, that you brought up that you weren't sure about, you can always email me about that. But again, just making sure that you go into detail, that you justify it, it needs to be directly related though to imperialism. Imperialism, imperialism, imperialism. Okay, so all these things relate to imperialism, Christianity, imperialism. Okay, so either the building of it happening or the decolonization, which is unbuilding of imperialism. Okay, so the undoing of imperialism. So any of those things would work. Okay, so one point for one, second point for another. Okay, last but not least, analysis and reasoning, soaps, okay, so two points for this. Now, um, some of you have been asking, do I need to do soaps for all five documents? Well, um, when we used to have seven documents, 60 minutes, I would say you have time. Because you're down to 45 minutes, five documents, it is really hard to have time to do all that. Now, what I would say, a couple of you have sent me your essays to grade. What I would say is those of you who are doing, let's say, four or five soaps, only maybe 50% of them are good. So I would say at least try to do four um, because even then your chances of getting all of them um, is still lower. Okay, because this is hard and you're not wrong for struggling with this. Soaps is hard. So... Still try, even if you're struggling at the end, you're rushing, still try to get um, at least four soaps done if you can because um, it's hard. Now, the biggest question is, how do I know which soaps to do? It, 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 it really, there's no right or wrong of the soaps. You're not going to get docked because you do speaker, occasion, audience, or purpose. It's just do you pull it off successfully. Um, it's really just what do you see in the document? Are you pulled towards source? If you really are pulled towards source, then sometimes speaker, speaker or audience, if you really read the document and you feel like, ooh, you see the message behind the message, you know what I mean? Um, so to speak, then occasion or purpose kind of tend to go with that. So now I'm going to go through my, my choice on these. And if you don't have that for yours, it doesn't mean you're wrong. It just means um, that it's something to consider, okay? And then maybe if you're struggling with soaps, hear what I am seeing in them and take that to heart as a, as a way of kind of learning and maybe see what you're missing, okay? So here we go. Um, document one. So document one, I really liked occasion. Um, this was a letter from the king, right? And But I really loved occasion because he kind of gives his cards away. In that first paragraph, he totally says, you know, you guys sent these missionaries in when we were negotiating the end of the slave trade, and I love these missionaries. So the occasion was, I totally see the British tactic was they sent the missionaries in as a bribery tactic, a negotiation tactic to sweeten the deal. Let's show some, let's show some charity here. Let's keep this relationship going, and let's make the, the people of Madagascar, which is going to be a third world country, let's make the king feel like we're going to give them charity. You know, oh, we're, look, we're going to do buildings. We're going to serve the, the poor. We're going to build schools. Look at what we're going to do. And clearly he loved it because he's writing a letter saying, yeah, when we did these negotiations, you sent this guy. I wasn't really sure. After upon analysis, I love it. Send more, you know? So the occasion is the tactic of the British worked and he wants more of it. And so clearly he likes what they're offering. He's drinking the Kool-Aid, so to speak, you know? Now, if you don't like occasion, audience is very clear. He's writing to this London Missionary Society, and he even says that, asking for more missionaries. So there's the clear obvious of what he's doing. So I really like occasion for that, because clearly the bribery tactic they use worked, okay? All right, document two. Um, document two, this was the, uh, Niger, um, the Niger former slave convert, okay? And I feel this one um, was pretty clear that the clear purpose of this was to find a place to send former slaves. Um, the reason I like purpose is because you don't see, two, two and three, you kind of see something really interesting. They're associated with Britain or Scotland, but you don't see white Europeans going. You see, you see Africans 
convert, former slaves converting, okay? So they're associated with Europe, but Europeans are not sending white Europeans there. So these are areas that are not considered worthy of white European missionaries, and that should tell you something, that it's not of the highest importance. It's white man's burden, but not enough of a burden to send their missionaries. Do you see what I mean? So clearly the purpose of this location is where do we send our former slaves? And this was kind of a scouting mission, you know? Um, where do we where do we send these people? And from the description of it, this place of Niger, it was pretty heathen, pretty wild from the description. And so I can only imagine that this was like, hey, you know, we got all these former slaves from Sierra Leone, you know, that have been uh, relieved. And I kind of see this as like, the British are kind of like, what do we do with all these former slaves? And they're kind of killing two birds with one stone. They're doing God's work. They're saying, see, we're sending out um, African converts to do God's work. And we're doing, you know, we're, look at, we've, we've fulfilled our white man's burden. We're converting people and we're sending them out to save other Africans. And I kind of see them patting themselves on the back, so to speak, for this. They, I feel like they kind of are very proud of themselves for this. Uh, so I think purpose is what do we do with all these these former slaves? Hey, look, we found somewhere to send them. And um, it's a pretty desolate place that we don't want to go. But look, we can pat ourselves in the God. We're do, we're, uh, pat ourselves in the back because we're doing God's work. So I kind of think purpose and occasion is a good one for this one. Okay, document three. Um, audience. Um, I like audience for this one because it's a letter in a newspaper. So even though it's another um, African convert, okay, who he's working in these diamond mines and he's talking about over the course of two years how, you know, this was this heathen place and now because he's there, people are doing better and, you know, now it's 50-50. I like audience because he says, you know, it's an article in the Scottish United Free Church. So I imagine this is to the people of the church. So he is a Yes, he is African and he's a convert, but he's writing this letter and they're printing it in their local, you know, paper in their church, you know, publication in their church. And basically think what great advertisers would be. See, see, look, continue donating. Look at your missionary dollars at work. Look at the success we're having with these, you know, these impoverished uh, diamond mine workers. And look, we're our, our missionary money is working. So keep keep uh, keep donating, you know, so to speak. So I think audience is a really good one. Um, now, anytime you do audience, let's be honest, if you're doing audience successfully, you're almost always incorporating purpose. So the audience are the the members or the attendees of this Scottish United Free Church back in Scotland. And the purpose is to get them to continue to donate. Now, if you didn't want to do audience, I think purpose is to report how successful this guy has been. Look what I've done in two years. Look at pat on the back to me and, you know, to give him praise, so to speak. Okay, uh, document four. I will be honest, of all five documents, this was probably the hardest one for me to soap. It was a picture, the sourcing on it was very, gave something, but it was very vague. It wasn't clear, it didn't give you a clear description of where they were going. The picture was, it had so many different things, but it wasn't very clear. It was very, it was just a lot of things. What's really hard, I think, when you have a lot of different things, to give a detailed soaps. So this one was probably the hardest. So if I was gonna skip one to soaps, it probably would have been document four. So I just did purpose because I think you can just kind of basically sum up imperialism. Um, I think the purpose of this is to show missionaries, but also to show the French official scope. The French are officially scoping things out in Africa. They're not just looking to spread Christianity, but they're looking, they have their soldiers, their ships, they're, basically, the three Gs are at work here, so maybe I should have put that down. I think what you see here is the French and the three Gs. You see their political aspect. You see their economic aspect. You see their religious aspect at work. They are looking to they are looking to practice imperialism, and I think you see that in the picture in a very vague sense. Um, I don't think you see much else. Um, I think the picture gives little hints of things, but there isn't a lot to analyze or to build off of there. So of all of them to, to soaps, I think document four was probably the hardest. Okay, document five. I did speaker on this one. Um, so this one was the instructions, uh, the oath of ministry, right, to people going to serve in Mozambique uh, for the Portuguese. And so I like speaker uh, because this is the Marine and Overseas um, Ministry of Portuguese. So giving official instructions to church officials serving on mission that even if in the mission field, you are to demonstrate loyalty to the flag, the government, the legal system. Um, and they talk about that. And when I talked about the document itself, I feel like they were pretty clear about that. So I think speakers are really good one that they're being very clear that you are about you're here serving the church, but you are Portuguese still. So don't get that, you know, let's not get that confused. And that is to be really clear. Um, and so I feel like that speaker, this is a really good, clear speaker one to do. 
Okay, so if you have any questions or anything like that, go ahead and email me. Um, again, I would hopefully see an, an increase. Last one I said a minimum five. I'd really like to see a six. Um, to be safe, um, I would love to see a seven. If you can get a seven or higher on this, um, I would feel really good on that going into the AP exam. Okay, so um, I think Monday I'm going to post this um on Friday, I'm going to give you some hints for the weekend what to do, but I'm thinking Monday we're going to do a Google Hangout. Um, Tuesday, I have to go to the school and check out. So Wednesday, so Tuesday, I, um, I'll i be available via email, but I won't be like doing anything online. Um, I'll let you get your stuff in order, and I'll give you like a list of things you need to get in order, like print off and do stuff like that. And then Wednesday, um, I'll have a final tips, things like that, and then Thursday's your exam. So I think um, Monday we'll do the Google Hangout. Um, I will try to figure out a time. I'll get that to you here this weekend. And then Tuesday, like I said, I have to check out at school. Um, so I'll be available via email, but I'll have a list of things for you to do Tuesday, things you need to have ready. You should be getting your e-tickets that day and stuff like that. And then Wednesday, I'll have a quick last minute video, like here's last minute things to make sure you're prepped. And then Thursday is your exam. Okay. Email with any questions. Um, hopefully you got through this. Um, I know it's a lot, but again, you know, going through this twice, you should have a pretty good hold on things of where you're at. Okay. Love you guys. I'll talk to you later.